Are we on the air? Yeah, we're on the air. Well, there, everybody. And uh, hey, Earl and Dalton Roberts, the famous writer and former political leader here in Chattanooga and songwriter. And, oh, man, you do everything. Well, thanks. Where are you getting your cabbage now? Is Ricky's back open? Oh, yeah. Ricky's is open, serving cabbage uh, just about every day. And they give you your dessert. I had banana pudding uh, was it, yesterday. And, yes, they, 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 they've got the cabbage. You, are you a big cabbage eater? Well, I noticed when I used to go to Ricky's, you was always there eating a big order of cabbage. Yeah, cabbage and radishes and onions and, uh, let's see, what else did I have? Bacon. B uh, a slice of bacon. He loves <laughs> he loves bacon left over from breakfast, Dalton. We we were out together one time, and he put a he put a piece in his coat, and he got in the truck the next morning, and he says, I smell bacon. <laughs> and there was that piece of bacon that I'd wrapped I'd up. I'd wrapped it in a little piece of aluminum car napkin or something, and I smell bacon, and, and that stayed with that jacket for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Wish I'd have brought my guitar with a song that going down this road feeling oh, I'd love that. I'll tell you right now, Dalton. And I like your, the, the way have, they have you set up in the paper now. That looks good. Thanks. Thanks what do they call it? You're... You're on another page, uh, lifestyle. What or what is that? Yeah, that's the lifestyle section. I'm, I'm in there on Friday now. I used to be on Tuesday on that editorial page, but I was glad to get moved to you. Truth, I like it over there. <laughs> a little different place in the paper, huh? Well, it don't put you under so much pressure to write about politics, you know. Yeah. I don't mind writing about politics, but I don't enjoy it as much as other things. This man can talk about anything. That is true. He's a, he, he know he's a learned gentleman, an erudite type of person that, that the world should know and get acquainted with by listening and reading to listening to him and reading his columns. I yeah. heard him the night that he was on the Grand Ole Opry, Luther, sung that song that he wrote about the gay dog. <laughs> the funniest thing. Yeah. The funniest thing. You're going to record that for somebody, aren't you? And then you say something. Oh, about I've that? recorded it. I've I've sold a lot of gay dog tapes. <laughs> <laughs> He was a big old dog, but he wouldn't bite when the female dogs come around. Trying to play dead. One day I was attacked by this little old fast, so I turned him loose and said, See him, Spike. He ran up to that little fast, and here's what he said. Arf, arf. And a big old mousy wowsy. Well, what have you been? What have you been doing with yourself lately? Well, I'm, you know, I'm as far as locally, I've been writing uh, for the Times and a few other local publications. I've got a column in Chattanooga on the Move uh, mm -hmm. every other month, mm -hmm. and I've written a few for Chattanooga Outlook and In Sync, and I've had uh, fifteen or twenty c uh, articles in national magazines too, mm -hmm. and I've been happy about that. But mainly, I've been playing music and writing. Now, that's just basically it, writing songs, writing another book, writing more columns, and uh, I've played a lot of folk festivals all over the country. I've done a good bit of traveling, Yeah. and I've enjoyed that a lot. You love Chattanooga, though, don't you? Yeah, I never seem to be able to... You know, I know, I, I found out in 94, or when I retired from the county, that if I was going to make it as a songwriter, I had to move to Nashville. They just, publishers... The, the 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 decision makers up there now, mm -hmm. they just won't mess with you if you don't live there. You got to be in their face all the time and on their back and around all the time. It's a different scene than it was when I was writing back in the seventies. Everything in Nashville was a family thing back then. Well, look at the three biggest publishing companies and you can see it. I wrote for Cedarwood. That was owned by the Denny family. Mm -hmm. Then there was Tree, which was uh, Jack Stout and Buddy Killen, and their families. Then there was Acuff Rose, which was Roy Acuff and Wesley Rose's boy. Uh, what was his name? I forgot his name, but anyway. Fred Rose? Fred Rose. Fred Rose's son, Wesley. So everything up there was family, and everybody sat around in their blue jeans all day long, and it was casual and informal. I went up there in 94 to resume my songwriting career, and I went to see this little guy, and he had on a little, little tie, and he had a master's degree in music from Middle Tennessee up on his wall. I mean, he was dressed up, fancy. It was Faith Hill's mm -hmm. ex-husband. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, the country. Like Daniel singer. Hill. Nice fellow. I'm not putting him down at all. But here I am sitting talking to this young guy, and he's listening to my songs to decide whether or not... They got 57 of my songs. That's the reason I was there. 
I thought, well, I'll go back to the place that bought Cedarwood, Polygram. It's Polygram Records and Music. And he said, Mr. Roberts, you're a master song craftsman, but you're not writing for today's market. I said, a good song is a good song in any market. All you got to do is just demo it, cut it, record it in that market. So why don't you all just recut some of my stuff? Pick out two or three of those you think got the best commercial possibilities and cut them like they're cutting them today, which I, by the way, don't care that much for today's contemporary country. It's kind of like the soft rock of the 70s, you know. Mm Mm-hmm. But anyway, I've made a long story out of this uh, in order to tell you what I've been doing, but I decided I wasn't going to move to Nashville. I had already been talking to somebody about sharing a condo up there, buying a condo and sharing it, uh, because I thought I wanted to spend my full time writing country music. But after I checked out the music and checked out the scene and the way it changed and all, I lost my zest for it. I said, I'm going to go home and write for myself, and I'll sell my little tapes and CDs wherever I go play. And that's what I've been doing. How's members of your band, Al Harvey? And... Well, you know, I hadn't had a band since 90. Oh, okay. Uh, I, okay. Quit, I quit playing You don't band. pick with Al anymore? Yeah, occasionally. Now, what I do now is play mostly singles and occasionally a duet with Al. Mm-hmm. Or a duet with Kenny Brown. Or right. a duet with Red Bird Klingon. How's or, Red Bird? He's doing fine. Or a duet with uh, Tim Starnes. When I do blues, I generally get Tim Starnes because he plays harmonica and slide guitar. Mm-hmm. So... I can't play for four or five hours anymore. I've got a bad, my left index fingers. When I was doctors, when they don't know what something is, they give it a big name. They call it a repetitive stress syndrome, mm-hmm. meaning that they say the joint is damaged from years of playing. When I had, when it was sore, I kept on playing anyway. Well, look at nightclubs today, Earl. Four or five hours. I can't get up there and hammer four or five hours. In the first place, it's, it's hard work. Stay out to 2.30 in the morning. Place full of smoke. I just get that whole scene gets on my nerves anymore. But you so, like to do these things like the Red Bank Jubilee and, and little that's festivals, right. don't little you? little quickies. Yeah. Somewhere where I can go and set up. The other night, I played the Home Builders Association. Yeah. And they fed me a good dinner, and then I get up and play for about forty-five minutes. So you're you've joined that category of musicians that go and play to to get a good meal, huh? I've heard a lot of musicians well, say <laughs> the only thing we get is a little fried chicken and mashed potatoes. We have a lot of fun. I mean, I'm gonna tell you the truth about it. I have made more mon- money playing single than I ever made playing with a band. Yeah. Because you got to get a lot of money to pay a band. Yeah. But to answer your question, Al Harvey's had some problems with the. Uh, uh, a venal break breakdown in his veins in his legs and he can't stand up for four or five hours anymore either but he'll he can sneak out you know he can go somewhere he's really disabled mm-hmm. but he can get away for uh, an hour and go somewhere and play a quick one but he's not playing much music yeah and what was the other guy in the band that uh did some solo work with you. His name slips my mind right now. Well, the last band I had uh, was Terry Brewer. Terry Brewer, that's yeah, the one. He, he's yeah. harmonica man, good mm-hmm. harmonica. Oh man, yeah, I love to hear him play the harmonica. And he's he's playing spot gigs too, kind of like I am. Yeah. The last time I heard, he was playing up at uh, a place on Highway 58, Debbie's, uh, Miss Debbie's something. Mm-hmm. And. He and Mike Harris were playing up there. Yeah. And Randall Smith played guitar for us, and he's over in McMinnville now, and I think he plays some of Monty Swan, the old RFD band. It used to be down on Amnicola. Uh, Kenny Brown and I played together up on the lake, a duet for quite some time, at a place called the Galley. Uh, I don't know what to call it now. It used to be called Bass Bay. It's had a hundred names. Got some good fish up there. Boy, yeah, and I love to play that place. You know, I could be sitting there on Friday night. We play from six to nine. I can play a six to nine gig because you got a good break in between. Earl, on a nice clear day, you could sit there on the stage where we were sitting singing and look for a mile down the lake, you Mm -hmm. know. Just a breathtaking view. Yeah. So we enjoyed playing that, and Kenny's, he's still playing some but he's not playing regularly. You know, nobody that was in that band, Bubba Meeks was our bass man part of the time and Al part of the time. Mm -hmm. Bubba still plays some spot gigs, and he still puts together a band sometimes and plays big gigs. Yeah. But he's he's still pretty active. I was uh, in Gulf Shores last September and uh, tuned in a station down there. I have no idea what the station's call letters were, but I heard they were playing your uh, gospel song, 
I wonder what uh, what he wrote in the sand. what he wrote in the sand. Uh, you got a lot of uh, airplay on that song. You know, I really did, and it was just on a compilation, a Southern Gospel compilation at Country Discovery Records, or I think they call it Chosen Vessel Records, the country the gospel version put out. I was really pleased with how much airplay it got. Now, I've got that coming up in a CD. Uh, I've, I've already recorded all the songs, and it's going to be, a, I think it's going to be one of my best CDs. Gospel CD or yeah. a mixture? Yeah, it's a gospel CD. Gospel CD. Did you write most of them, or are you doing a cross I wrote section? them all. I, I co-wrote one with uh, Ruthie Steele. She's a Nashville songwriter, and she and I do some co-writing. I'm doing a lot of co-writing now. Mm -hmm. Co-writing with Ruthie Steele in Nashville, Glenn Martin in Florida, in Ocala, Florida, mm -hmm. and Redbird and I, and then uh, Cecil Noel, the guy that wrote, I forgot more than you'll ever know, he and I. Is doing. Cecil still going? Yeah, he and I still doing some... I haven't heard of him in... 30 years. Uh, he was a good friend with Lee Cooper. Remember the late Lee Cooper? Yeah, I sure do. Yeah, Cecil. Uh, Cecil, uh, Lee Cooper's the one who introduced me to Cecil. Is that right? And Cecil got Don't Pay the Ransom recorded. That's right, yeah. He carried it out to Nat Stuckey's farm. Uh-huh. And Nat was riding a tractor around doing something. And he handed him a little hand tape recorder. And he said, you got to hear this song. And Nat listened to it, and he said, I'm recording tomorrow. Bring that to the studio. I'll learn it and, and record it tomorrow. And he did the next day. Top ten record, too. Yeah, it was top ten in all. It was number one in a lot of markets. Yeah, don't pay the ransom, honey, I'll escape. I played that on the Grand Ole Opry, too. Did you? But the Gay Dogs one, I got to stand in over. That's Betty Clark's favorite song. I believe the Gay Dog is. She likes that one. You did a little tune, uh, I don't know that you ever recorded it or not, but you wrote one, Old Paul Clark. I've got that somewhere. Yeah, I wrote one about when they had the state, the state solid waste officials meeting here. I don't, <laughs> Lord, what do you call people that are say so? <laughs> anyway? <laughs> high level garbage people, I yeah, guess. Yeah. Paul's Paul's one of my favorites, so I'm not putting him down. At all. I know he's, he's one of the finest guys I know. But he was, uh, I believe he was president or incoming president or outgoing president or something. And Betty asked me if I'd write a song for him. Well, it just so happened I had been in a John a few days before. And they had a little sign. Right when you sat out on the John, they had a little <laughs> sign right in front of you and said, this may be the only time today that you know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> so that's exactly what I wrote that song about. Oh, wait. I have uh, I've got a recording of that somewhere just on a, on a little cassette tape. You did that before a convention? or? Yeah, or? it was at his, his convention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you ought to put that on the... <laughs> one of your albums, <laughs> and, and write one about Luther. Now, now, you've known Luther all your life, and you could write one about him, Dalton. Yeah, I, I believe I could. I, I, Sixty I, I, years in the business. I that's mean, incredible. It sure is. It sure is. Well, do you miss politics? I don't miss it a bit. Now, I'll just be honest with you. I'm not going to sit here and 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 uh, posture around about politics. I'm going to say two or three things about it. Uh, I'm going to do what I, the only thing I know to do because i got such bad memory. That's just tell the truth. The number one truth is that I enjoyed being in politics for a long time. Number two truth is I'm very grateful to the people for giving me that job. And I'm grateful to God for giving me that chance to serve. It was 16 years of my life that I will always appreciate and remember. Uh, number three, I would say... It just really started burning me out. And it's my personality as much as anything. I can't get away from it. I can't go down and play golf in Florida one week out of the month. Or, you know, when I'm doing something, I'm absorbed in it. I don't care whether it's writing a song or running the county. And I just got to where I, I was just burned out. That's all it was to it. Two of the things that you wanted to do, but didn't quite make it have already been done now and number one is privatized Silverdale and then the nursing home uh, has been sold I mean y we did a lot of news stories and you 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 uh you made a lot of trips to Silverdale and the nursing home those were those were challenges for you during your 16 years weren't they yeah I was the first person to privatize a county 
uh, penal thought. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that was under your uh, under your watch. Okay, right at the end of your last I, term. I began to see toward the end of my tenure down there that I'd forgotten about. I think that. Claude did the right thing about selling the nursing home because I began to see toward the end of my tenure with the state sitting on your shoulder on one hand, not telling you exactly what to do and in increasing the standards mm -hmm. under which you operate, and on the other hand, cutting your money every year. And a federal government is virtually getting out of the business of helping counties that were trying to take care of their senior citizens. They got to where every year was digging deeper and deeper into the county tax structure to support something which, under the state constitution and under all the laws of the state, is not really a function of the county. Yeah. It's not a legally mandated function like education or roads or solid waste or hundreds and hundreds of other things that you're mandated to do. Well, it broke my heart because, as you probably know, that was my favorite agency. I'd go out there and play, and I knew so many of those patients and everything, but I just began to see that we just couldn't keep it going with very little help out of the state except more harassment than help mm -hmm. out of the state. And the federal government is retiring from everything except helping rich folks, you know. That's the only thing <laughs> they're still in. Yeah. And, of course, that's the reason for that is that rich folks are electing all of them. Money's ruined the national political situation. Yeah. It's just got so much septic affluent in the punch bowl that, you know, you can't hardly get elected anymore if you don't have a fortune. And I'm just tired of being a part of it, you know. Uh, let's just say, you know, somebody runs that you really like, and there's some people that I really like, and I give them $100. That's a grain of sand. Somebody, how much attention do you think they're going to pay to me? When somebody is giving them 5000 10000 or more, those big pieces of money that are coming to the... the uh, those are the people that get heard. You know, I'm not going to say who it is because it's somebody I happen to like a lot, but just as soon as uh, I was asked, I gave him $100. And that's a lot of money for me, Earl. I don't have a lot of money. Uh, all I've got in cents is just notes asking for more money. I don't get involved in any decision. The main thing I have to offer that man is a political brain that has been trained in 40 years of politics. A knowledge of this area. I was Southeast Tennessee chairman uh, of all the governments in Southeast Tennessee for seven years. I know the county executives, I know the mayors, I know the people, I know the different counties and sort of how they're structured. That's what I've got to offer somebody. I had a county executive tell me, oh, six months ago, I really miss Dalton Roberts. Well, I got along with him. I saw something that people don't see now, and that is if we don't operate regionally. Well, let's just look at this, Earl. If you had a company come in here that wanted 150 or 250 or something acres to build a big manufacturing plant with a lot of good jobs, where are you going to put them? You're not going to put them in Hamilton County, most likely because you can't find those kind of blocks of land with sewers. In all of these rural counties, we got plenty of land. They need us, we need them. Mm -hmm. It's an umbilical relationship, really. So it, it uh, that's what I have to offer somebody, though. But you see, they don't want that. They want money so they can buy those little pop, those little pop ads where you pick it, somebody's most vulnerable point. And all these ad cam campaigns have become anymore, all that these political campaigns have become have been snipe attacks. Sniper attacks is a better way. Nobody sits down anymore and discusses the issue in a sane, rational way. That's one thing I admired Al Gore for, telling Bradley, instead of us spending all this money on TV spots, let's just finance a bunch of, of national debates and let the people look at us standing nose to nose and toes to toes and presenting our thoughts and our ideas of what's better for America. That's what we need. Mm -hmm. But all we got sniper attacks, and the more money somebody can get for sniper attacks, the better chance he's got. Well, what Bush has raised is just... It's obscene. That's all there is to it. It's obscene. And what most politicians raise today is obscene. I um, made the statement on the program a few weeks ago that I felt that the federal government should give us the volunteer army ammunition property and caught a lot of heat for it. I mean, we're fixing to pay seven and a half million dollars to the federal government for something that your mom and dad and my mom and dad 
paid for through their taxes. That's right. You're right about that. Was, was I wrong to, no, to sir, take that position? No, well, this should have given it to I you. mean, we can use that in this county if people would just drive down Bonnie Oaks and see what you and your constituents did at the other end of the street. Yeah. We can use that. Maybe for an incinerator project, maybe for a landfill, maybe for another industrial park. I don't know. I don't have the brain power. Probably that's what we elect. Up. That's what we elect. You know, people like yourself to do. But I think it is ridiculous that the federal government's going to charge us seven and a half million dollars for that land out there, which we paid for time and time again. Well, certainly it's ridiculous. They should have given it to the to local governments to create jobs. If they wanted to put stipulations to make sure that it wasn't used for any other thing, well then they should have done that. And I would hate to see it just turned over to random helter-skelter development. Mm -hmm. Because where else have we got 8,000 acres of land? Now admittedly, a lot of that is topographically not suited for heavy industry. We found that out. See, Pat Rose and I started to think about about the the VAP property. We took two, the chairman and the past chairman of the uh, Chamber of Commerce, uh, Herb, sorry, I can't... Herb Adcock? No, he, he's dead now. He was the head of combustion. Uh, he's a good good civic leader. And I know who you're talking John, about. John Germ was the, was the chairman of the, of the chamber that year, and Herb was the outgoing mm -hmm. uh, chairman. And Pat and I went to Washington with them, and we saw Howard Baker's staff, and then we saw Jim Sasser and his staff in Maryland, and we expressed for the first time our interest in that property. And Senator Sasser said, if you'll come up with a plan... You remember Senator Sasser, don't you? Oh, yes. Senior Senator from the great state of Tennessee. I loved that man. The Sasser said to by the way, I got to imitate him one time on the program when he got up to roast me, and he, I went over to his aide, and I said, do you think it'd be all right with the senator if I do my, my Senator Sasser imitation? He said, well, he'll love it. So I did it, and he took it real well. Yeah. But we went up there and talked to them about that property, and boy, did we ever get a stonewall. The Army, you know, really stonewalled us. Said they might need it again. I said, now, you can't tell me that you're going to go out there in a highly urbanized area. That was country back when they was making ammunition out there. I know, because I was a boy. And I went to Tyner, and our school bus drove right through that fog in the morning, which would almost eat the paint off of the school bus from where they was making those explosives. Rex Ritchie was a sheriff back then, if you remember, and that stuff ate the paint off of his house, and he eventually sold his house and moved me. I think of what he's doing to everybody's lungs. He was mm -hmm. doing all that to the paint on the walls. I said, "You're not going to tell me that you're going <laughs> you're going to start making something out there." Well, we got better. We got better air pollution control now. I said, "You ain't got that good air pollution control. That's an urbanized area." Why don't you give that to us and let us generate jobs? We're running out of land for jobs. See, that's that's the reason that I feel, Dalton, that the federal government should give it to this county and city for economic development. Sure. I mean, you have when you were in government, and I'm sure Claude's got people up there now that do nothing but make out applications to the government for grants. I mean, what's the difference? What would be a better grant to this community than to give us a few hundred acres so that we could create some jobs than sitting and, and writing out a grant application for several hundred thousand dollars for this or this or this? I mean, that would be a perfect gift. Absolutely. You know, you're exactly but I right. Had people, I had people email me, and I had people say, Earl, you know, it's not fair for the people out in Washington State to to, to help pay for something for us, you know, I said, well, if they had land out there and they needed it, I'd take the same position yeah, for them. Were, if they were closing some kind of uh, military installation out there, the people in that community would try to get the land. And I'll bet you, if you got a lawyer to look into it, or a person who knew how to research this, you'd find that the federal government has given a lot of property that no longer lead, need to local and communities. I bet they have. Mm -hmm. I'd bet big money that they have. So why there's been this change, I don't know. Maybe Zach can, can do some reasoning with them. Now, I wouldn't care if they put stipulations on it. In fact, I would love for them to put stipulations on it to make sure that nobody starts using it for any other purpose other than to generate jobs for this community. Right. Because that's what we need. I know you heard it during your time in office. I've heard it on this program over and over and over again. Jobs, 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 jobs. We need some good jobs for this county. And this land... 
you know, you just said we have to go outside of this county to find uh, a, a lot of land in order for development. That's that, I guess, is is the main place that we can develop, isn't it? Oh yeah, I remember one time when I worked as close with Donna Hubbard, the county executive up in Bradley County, as I've ever worked on any local project to get a real, real large company in this area because we finally decided. Their, their people told us that the only potential site at all you've got, and they told us where it was, and it was in Bradley County. We went up there and worked on that and tried to get it, all the plats and everything grown up. I worked as hard to get that in Bradley County because, see, in Dallas, my son drives an hour in the morning to get to work, or he did. He's got his own company now, but when he was working for an oil company down there, he drove an hour in the morning to get to work and an hour home in the afternoon. People are used to that in these big areas. To drive up to Cleveland would take you 30 minutes. And a lot of Chattanooga people would have been hired if we could have got that company in Cleveland. Just as Cleveland people come down here and work in Chattanooga companies. You know, we're one community. All these little barriers we put up, you know. I remember what that man said, uh, one of those astronauts said when he was out there in space looking down on Earth. And he thought, who put all these walls up separating Earth? It looks like one living, breathing, vital community down there from up here in space, you know. But we got all these little barriers we have to climb over and climb around in order to think. We can't think about this area. We got to think about Hamilton County. And if we're elected from the 6th district or the 4th district or something of the city council or the county commission, we can't think about the 7th, 8th, 9th of the whole county. I love district representation, but the big problem with it is that people quit thinking about the total community. If they represent a black area, they start thinking black all the time. If they represent a white rich area, they think white rich all the time. Well, that's the tendency, and that's dangerous. You know, we're one community, and if we can't see that, we're not going to we're not going to go very far. Does this discussion that, well, Councilman Don Eves, I think, has sort of taken the forefront, but some of the other city council members in Chattanooga uh, have chimed in. But does this concern you that? They're talking now about establishing Chattanooga County and succeeding from Hamilton County because of tax inequities? Well, it disturbs me that the relationship has gotten so bad that uh, the councilman feels that he has to lay that out to... Uh, I think he's trying to get the county's attention. Uh, I don't think that legally will ever work, uh, but I think he's trying to get the county's attention to the fact that the city is a part of the county, and I think probably that's a tendency of the county to forget that. And it's also a tendency of the city to forget that they set up their own government. They chose to impose a tax on themselves. They chose to do all these extra things and to tax themselves additionally for it. And they have no right to whine about that because that was a decision they made when they became a city, and they can go out of that business when they want to, as Commissioner Coker has said. I see both sides of it, because I was in the city government, you know, for 12 years, and then was in county government for 23, and I see both sides of it. And the big problem is that we just cannot see we're one community. If we don't see that, we're going to just keep fussing instead of moving and building. But we love to fuss down here, you know. Oh, man, we get off on this. This is, this is our jollies, is fussing. Mm-hmm. Well, I was surprised, as I think a lot of people were, when they tossed out this idea of, uh, of another county because we've just gone through a tremendous challenge of merging these two school systems, taking and separating them again and having the Chattanooga schools and the Hamilton County schools. That would be a mess. You probably would have lawsuit after lawsuit over who owns this property and whose property this is. I mean... It seems to me like, Dalton, it was, it was a waste of breath, really. I mean, shouldn't we be sitting down and the members of the city council sitting down with the members of the county commission and saying, let's see where that we can consolidate some services like we've done with courts, like we've done with, with ambulance service and, and, and in some of these areas? Shouldn't we be, be sitting down and, 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 trying, and trying to come up with some reasonable a uh, way to consolidate services to save money instead of talking about establishing a new county? Well, no doubt about it. Uh, you know, you, 
But see, what is so obvious to you, you have the affliction of being a private citizen. They, they're not afflicted with that. They're, first of all, a city councilman, a city councilwoman, a county commissioner, county with emphasis on the county, not on the commissioner, on the county and on the city. And you're just, you're afflicted with this problem of, of being a, an average citizen who's not bar burdened with all these little things you've got to defend and fuss about. You're logical. And once you get into a political job, you've got to start thinking like, or you think you do, you've got to start thinking like a commissioner from the first district supposed to think. And the first thing you know, you can't think any other way. And I'm afraid that as far as the council people and the commissioners both are concerned, that neither one of them pay as much attention as they ought to Maybe this is just no county executive grinding an axe, but they don't pay enough attention to the two people who are elected to represent all the people of Chattanooga, which is the mayor, and all the people of the entire county, including all the ten cities, which is the county executive. I don't think they listen as much to them as, as, as they should, because they're getting to where they enjoy these fond fights. They enjoy them. And I reckon it gives them some feeling of, of importance or something that representing all the people maybe doesn't give them. I can't understand that, but uh, it's, it's not really the healthiest situation we've ever had here, I'll say that. And I hate to see it, and I'm not putting them down. I'm just saying they need to realize the direction they're taking us, which is divisiveness and fussing and not pulling on the same piece of rope, and not trying to pull on the same projects and put things together anymore. There hasn't been one industrial park even talked about since I left office. Not one. And that's what generates jobs. That's what generates jobs. You know, the reason they're not talking about it now is because we've got full employment. People can cuss Clinton all he wants to, but he's been good for the economy, apparently. And... He, the whole national situation has been good for the economy. But look how it was in 1978. You remember how we was bloodletting jobs? I mean, they were just streaming out of Chattanooga. Companies just streaming out of here. Due to foreign competition and the inability at the local level to finance the infrastructure changes that they needed in order to compete internationally. We've got an international economy, and that's going to be with us from now on. That's not something that's going to change. We better think international or are we going to be left behind? But while we have a good economy today, are we doing what we should be doing to plan for tomorrow? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And we got way too much attention on the downtown. And I was in support of all those downtown things and paid a bitter price for it politically at times. I was one of the early, most verbal, outspoken supporters of the aquarium when everybody was calling it Jack's Fish Tank. You remember those days? Oh, yes. I didn't flinch a bit because I thought it couldn't do anything but help anchor the downtown, help anchor that part of the downtown, which was nothing. You realize that that whole area at that end of the town was only, was only paying something like $80,000 in property taxes back then. All that old land manufacturing property, the old American manufacturing property, which was already vacated. I realize that I went to school there. I yeah. think you did, too. Mm-hmm. That whole area was just dis disintegrating. We needed something to anchor that. And that was an exciting concept, and we had a businessman who was willing to raise $50 million to make it happen. Yeah, we owe him for it. And I wanted to support him in that because I thought he was right. Uh, so I'm in, I'm in favor of doing things downtown, but River Valley has become River City again. River Valley Partners. It's become River City again because the focus is just getting absorbed all together in the downtown and not in the River Valley, the whole area. When we set up that thing as an economic development arm, we set it up to get jobs for the entire River Valley area, meaning this whole part of the country, southeast Tennessee, northwest Georgia. And if we don't do that, we're going to lose a lot of jobs. And all we're going to have is a pretty downtown, and it's going to be thriving and bubbling. But those are not the best jobs in the world. 
You know that. I'm for tourism jobs because a lot of people need jobs and a lot of people can't do technical work or administrative work or uh, real high skill labor work. So you need tourist jobs and they're clean jobs like Bob Elmore used to tell us all the time. Bob's one of the most delicate spokesmen we ever had for the value of tourism to the economy. And he would always make that point that it was clean jobs. And it is. But you know, Earl, you've got to have some, you've got to have some, uh, some companies coming in that have technological bases. You got to have some companies coming in that have manufacturing bases. We're always going to have manufacturing. Some people think because they invented computers, manufacturing is going to go away. It, it will go away if we are not attentive to it because it'll go to these little countries where they have no air pollution control standards and these companies will go in there and rape that environment. You know, birds fall out of the air in Mexico City from air pollution. Fall out of the air dead and plunk down on the ground. Well, people aren't going to put up with that in America. But we can compete. We've got the greatest technological base in the world. And a lot of companies have competed. And we can draw some of those international companies in here. Look, uh, I was a part of drawing three major Japanese companies in here. We can compete. But we can't compete if we're just going to think about downtown tourism. Mm -hmm. we, we can't do it. We, we, we're getting myopic. Very myopic. My guest this morning is former Hamilton County Executive Dalton Roberts, musician, good friend. I need to take a break. I, I really, I get, to, I get inspired by listening to you, Dalton, because you challenge us, but at the same time, you let us know that uh, we have to meet these challenges, and that's, that's what I like about your personality.